Hi, my name is Henry Hoffman. I'm an occupational therapist and the co-founder of SABO. With me today is Tony Thornton. Tony suffered a stroke two years ago. He's going to help me today assist with demonstrating the proper way to assess, measure, and fit patients with the SABO stretch device. With regards to the assessment, you want to look at some important criteria. And the first uh, step for looking at important criteria would be to make sure that the individual has mild to moderate soft tissue shortening or tone. If the individual has severe soft tissue shortening or tone, then he or she will not be a candidate for the SABO stretch. So that's very important. Uh, you also want to make sure that you can uh, passively range the patient to neutral at the wrist with the fingers straight with moderate force. If you passively range the wrist to neutral with the finger straight with greater than moderate force, then the patient will not be appropriate for the SABO stretch. So let's test Tony and see if he is a candidate for the SABO stretch. So we're going to put his wrist in flexion. We're going to relax his fingers and try to stretch them out so they're straight. And we are going to, with the finger straight and the wrist in flexion, we're going to slowly bring him up with no greater than moderate force and see if we can get him to a neutral position. As you can see here, we can easily get Tony to a neutral position at the wrist with the finger straight. If it took us more than moderate force to get him to this position, then Tony is not a good candidate for the Sabo stretch at this time. Uh, but you can see, not a problem getting him to a neutral position with the finger straight. And obviously, we can go above and beyond that. So in a few minutes, we'll discuss the measurement, and then we'll go over the fitting. Now that we have determined that Tony is appropriate for the Sabo stretch, it is time to measure him for the device. To assure a good fitting experience, it's imperative that the measurements that we provide are accurate and performed correctly. Placing Tony's hand flat on the table, I'm going to take a measurement just distal to the MCPs. You can notice that the fingers are in an adducted position, and then what you want to do is you want to measure the fingers just distal to the MCPs, but you don't want to wrap around the edges, so you want a nice flat linear measurement. If your patient has a lot of tone and soft tissue shortening, feel free to curl the fingers in to get the same measurement. So it's not imperative that the fingers are flat. You can also do a measurement as such, but make sure that you don't wrap the tape measure around the edges. If your measurement is on the border between two different sizes, assess the length of the fingers before selecting the appropriate size device. For example, if the fingers are long and lean, you may want to select a larger size device. Conversely, if the fingers are short and wide, you may want to select a smaller size device. When your Sabo stretch arrives, it'll come to you flat in a box. What you'll notice is there's a Sabo stretch manual for you to review on the proper fitting of the device. You'll also notice that there's a Sabo stretch quick fitting guide, which is step by step on how to quickly put the device on. Also, in the box is the Sabo stretch, which is in a flat position. Later we'll show you the appropriate way how to bend the wrist mount, thumb mount, and forearm stabilizers to correctly fit the device. You'll notice that there are several straps. There's two forearm straps, a palm strap, two finger straps, one here as well as one in the back for you to use. You'll see a fifth digit strap and a thumb strap. Also in the box are two additional spring steel hand plates. Attached to the Sabo stretch is a red hand plate. There's two other hand plates, one that's blue and one that's yellow. Yellow is for weaker resistance, while blue is for strong resistance. And finally in the box, you will see a little tool kit, which includes a screw as well as a wrench for you to make any other adjustments or if you lose a few of the screws. And you'll also notice that there are some Breathe King Preen uh, pads. These pads can be cut and placed on the back of the splint to protect the skin of the patient where the hook is. So you can place this breathing cream cover uh, so it, it will protect the skin as well as the clothing. Before we fit Tony with the Sabo stretch, we first must determine where we want to set the wrist angle to maximize the stretch on the finger flexors. To determine the appropriate wrist position, let's drop the wrist in flexion and let's straighten out the fingers. And what we're going to slowly do is bring Tony up towards neutral until we feel that first resistance. And what you'll start to feel 
is the index finger and the middle finger will start to resist your hand. You can also notice that there's some blanching that's going to occur. But you got to make sure that the digits are in a straight position. So I'm starting to feel some resistance right at about plus 5 degrees, a little above neutral. So what we're going to do is we're going to set the wrist angle on the sabo stretch to about plus 5 degrees. If we bend the wrist mount to plus 35 degrees, what you're going to start to see is the fingers are going to start to draw back. So that's not the appropriate wrist angle position. For Tony's situation, the best position for him at this point will be about plus 5 degrees when we start to feel that resistance. For chronic patients, it's not uncommon to set the wrist angle initially at neutral or slight flexion. So in some patients, you'll start to feel the resistance right around minus 10, minus 15, even minus 20 or 25 degrees. So that's not uncommon. You don't want to set the wrist angle lower than 35 degrees of flexion due to increased pressure in the carpal tunnel and any carpal instability concerns. So you really want to try to avoid setting the wrist angle in too much flexion. So to be safe, it may be uh, common for some of the chronic patients to be a little below neutral, but you really want to try to shoot for keeping that wrist angle as close to neutral as possible to start. And with Tony, we'll start him off with plus five degrees. Now that we've determined that Tony's wrist angle position needs to be set at plus five degrees, let's discuss the proper way of bending the wrist mount. What you'll see is there's a notch on the ulnar side of the splint. You are going to find the edge of the table and put the notch up against the edge of the table, put the sable stretch in a flat position, and bend it to the appropriate amount. In this case, we are looking for five degrees of wrist extension. And at this stage, we are good to go with the fitting. Now that we've bent the wrist mount, it's time for the fitting. The first thing you want to do is bend the forearm stabilizers and bend the thumb mount. By bending the thumb mount, you just simply grab the thumb mount, bring it down just a little, you don't need to bend it too much, and then bend the thumb stop in. At this stage, we're ready to uh, put the device on and apply the straps. The first thing you want to realize is there's the two forearm straps. You have a proximal forearm stra uh, strap and a distal forearm strap. The proximal forearm strap is actually longer. That one you're going to apply proximal on the forearm. The distal forearm strap is going to be applied near the wrist. So when we put the device on Tony, the first thing we want to do is apply the forearm straps. So to put the device on Tony, what I like to do is have his fingers straightened and then try to get him all the way to the edge of the splint of the handpiece, that's going to tell me that the forearm is positioned in the correct position. Now if Tony can't stay in this position because of the tone, it's okay if the fingers curl in while we apply the forearm straps. So now that we know we're in a good position, at this stage we'll take the uh, proximal forearm strap and the distal forearm strap. I'm going to start with the distal forearm strap, attach it underneath the volar surface of the sable stretch, apply some pressure, and have a snug fit. Later we can loosen up the straps if we need to. Then we're going to apply the proximal forearm strap and it's okay if uh, the fingers stay in a curled position uh, that it's fine during this one. Apply the proximal forearm strap and then pull it down nice and tight. So now we're done with the forearm straps. At this stage what we're going to do is straighten out the fingers and apply the thumb strap. And as you can see I've already attached the thumb strap for the demonstration. So I'm just going to straighten out Tony's fingers, loosen up the thumb strap, straighten it out, and apply it right to the thumb mount and attach. So now the thumb is in a nice stretched position. What's really nice about that is when the thumb is stretched out, it kind of loosens up all the other fingers. So that's a good little strategy while uh, donning the device on the patient. The next step is to apply the uh, hand strap. And what you have here is the hand strap. All you need to do is attach it to the volar side of the splint, come up and around, and that will stabilize the hand strap so you can finish with the finger straps and the fifth digit straps. With the finger straps, as you know, now there are two finger straps. Uh, you can use just one finger strap if the patient has mild tone. If they have more on the moderate tone side, feel free to use both straps. For the purpose of this demonstration, I will do both straps. So all you need to do is attach the finger strap to the volar side of the sable stretch, and then you can come around uh, like such, 
have it nice attached and pull it around and it will hook to the Velcro. For that second strap, please make sure you don't want to cover the PIP joints. So you want to have a strap that's just proximal to the PIP joints and then the second strap is just going to be distal to the PIP joint. If you have a strap that goes over the joint, that could um, unfortunately cause hyperextension of the joint. So we don't want that to happen. So we'll have one strap that's proximal to the joint and one strap that's distal to the joint. Also, Tony's using a large splint, so we don't need to trim the straps. If Tony was using a small or a medium Sabo stretch, then we would want to trim the straps by a quarter to a half an inch. So I'm just going to put that second strap in, attach it just distal to the PIP joint for you, and then finally we're going to put the fifth digit strap that slides into the groove, connects, and then you can stabilize the fifth digit. So that's out of the way. And finally, we have the Breathe Apreme cutouts. That is going to be cut and shaped and attached to the Velcro hook on the volar side so it will protect the skin and clothing when the Sable Stretch is resting on the patient's lap. Now that we fit Tony's Sable Stretch, we want to double check the position by having him do something exertive. As we know with tone, when the patient laughs, sneezes, walks, gets up out of the chair, the tone in the fingers and the wrist want to kick in. So we can control that by adjusting the wrist mount, modifying the straps, as well as changing out the hand plate. As you know, we selected the red hand plate, which came with the Sabo Stretch, um, as the primary hand plate to use for Tony. Um, we can always certainly change to a yellow or weaker hand plate, depending on his tone, or a blue hand plate. So what we're going to do is we're going to have Tony try something exertive. And when he tries something exertive, such as walking, we'll have him try. If the fingers pull out of the splint, that tells us we can do two things. We can either lower the wrist mount angle. Right now it's at plus five. We can lower it down to neutral or maybe minus five. Or we can switch to a weaker hand plate. So when we do the exertive test with Tony, we're going to see if the fingers stay put. If the, if the fingers stay in the correct position, then we're not going to do anything to the splint. If the fingers start to pull out, of the original position because of the tone, then what we'll want to do is make that change either we'll drop the wrist mount or we will switch to a weaker hand plate. So Tony, what I'd like you to do is stand up, uh, walk two feet, and then come back and sit down in the chair. Good. And then come on back. And what we're looking for is to see if the fingers pull out of the splint and to see if we need to make any changes to this one. And as you can see, the fingers stay exactly where we want them to stay. Um, in fact, when the tone kicked in for Tony, it was very subtle, but you would see that the dynamic hand piece bent into a little flexion and then it relaxed. So we're pretty happy with the position he's currently at. Um, the key for Tony is, as he wears his splint on a daily basis, the goal is to ultimately improve and increase that wrist angle to really give a nice stretch to the wrist and finger flexes. So over time, our goal will be to increase Tony's wrist angle um, so he can improve and reverse and minimize some of this soft tissue shortening and decrease some of the tone he currently has. Thank you for joining us today with learning how to correctly assess, measure, and fit individuals with the Sabo Stretch. If you have any questions about the fitting process or the order process, please contact us and we'll be happy to help you. Thank you.